right, you guys, you guys, you guys, you guys, welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of the Donovan Sadiq Show on the Inland Empire Informer. I am Donovan Sadiq. I am the Inland Empire Informer, as you guys know. I have a special guest that I want to introduce you guys to. She is running for the 41st District of Congress. As we know, Mark Takano represents us here in the 41st District. And also another candidate that has made the ballot is Aja Smith, who's running as a Republican. I want to introduce to you guys Dr. Grace for Congress Williams. Welcome to the show. Thank Welcome you. to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the you know for coming out because a lot of the candidates do not <laughs> want to come on this show because they think it's a gotcha show or it's something that oh I don't have to worry about that it's you know oh well it's what show is that oh. right right <laughs> but little do they know this show has upset a lot of campaigns really? in the local area I mean I I, I, I got to take the credit. Cheryl Chevron Brown, as we guys, you guys know, she's gone, and so on, so on, so forth. So we're going to keep doing. And Denise Fleming, if you run for mayor again, I'm going to come out. I'm going to come out and get you. So anyway, it is your show. Um, just tell everybody a little bit about, you know, just your basic background. By the way, she is a army veteran. Did your eight years, six years? Yeah, oh three to eleven. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So so she's been there, done that. You got your VA card. Anything? Yeah. Okay. Get my VA yeah, you get your VA. Will, yeah, so we can go to the commissary. Commissary. Get, you get those benefits. That's, that's right. Yeah, you exactly. got those injuries? No. No. You, no. Not on camera. You, don't never, you never say that on camera. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but uh, no, great. That's something to think about. If you're a veteran, there's over 70,000 veterans in the Inland Empire area. We are the seventh biggest veteran area in the United States. So we have a base over there that is strategically needed. And if uh, you're, you're a veteran and you want somebody to look out for your needs, that's another aspect that you have going mm -hmm. for you. So just tell us a little bit yeah, about it. I appreciate it. it. Well, you, I, uh, I was born in the state of Washington okay. and uh, grew up in the Samoan Islands. I grew up with my mom's parents. I was raised there and uh, 17 came out to Los Angeles, studied civil engineering at USC for a few years and then switched majors, uh, got my bachelor's degree out in LA. And during that time, did a lot of work with nonprofits. Uh, I'm big on nonprofits. Worked a lot with the homeless in on Skid Row uh, with nonprofits there. Moved out to the IE, affordable housing. Worked with the County of Riverside for uh, over five year, years doing urban planning work there. Came out to March. Worked with the March Joint Powers Authority for nearly 11 years doing community and economic development work there. And then um, went on to the city of Paris for uh, nearly two years before I decided to uh, jump, run for Congress. And um, it was only three. I, mm -hmm. I joined the military, did the Army National Guard. Okay. Um, and, you know, I'm really proud of my military experience, uh, really proud of my experience at March. I learned a lot there. In fact, that's where I got a lot of my exposure on the federal government. So I've lobbied for projects uh, in Washington, D.C. I've successfully brought in federal dollars for infrastructure and skills training. In fact, last year I helped the city of Paris bring in more than five and a half million dollars mm. uh, locally to build a skills training center in their downtown where it's very much needed because less than 20% of their high school grads are going to college. So the skills center is going to certify individuals in advanced manufacturing, welding, and nursing. Okay. So I'm really big on trade and technical skills and, you know, I'm excited to be here and sort of have a chat with you, let people know who I am. I'm definitely not afraid of difficult conversations. I think mm -hmm. if you're going to be running for office and putting yourself out there, it's really important and valuable that voters know who you are, so I'm happy to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, you know, uh, you were in the, uh, the Guard. Uh, being a citizen soldier, is that kind of hard to, to... To balance? Yeah, to balance because, I mean, you know, you were in college and stuff, so why did you join the Guard, just, just in general? So I, you know, uh, I joined the Guard after 9-11, and much of that was a desire to just get into the fight, and the exposure was really good for me. I was a uh, uh, 42 Alpha, uh, which is a... Uh, I'm Air Force, HR. I don't know what that means, but uh, yeah, HR, okay. It's an HR specialist, and so that gave me an opportunity to interact with soldiers that deployed and those that returned, and so I saw firsthand sort of the challenges that our soldiers had in transitioning from... Uh, you know, active military duty to civilian life. And that struggle continues today. Surprisingly, Absolutely. Absolutely. there's a lot of gaps in our veteran services that need to be filled. 
the benefit of being a veteran and knowing what happens firsthand is that then you can influence, use that experience to influence policy so it's more effective for, for prior military. All right. Um, I got a few questions that I, I just got to hit you with. Um, why run for Congress? Have, have you actually ran before? I mean, you know, it's, it's unusual for somebody to just come out of the blue and say, hey, I'm going to run. I mean, what is it about, you know, Mark Takano's leadership or lack of thereof that made you say, you know what, we need to change, we need something different? Uh, so we're in the 31st district. So the district covers the cities of Harupa Valley, Riverside, Marina Valley, Paris, and the March Air Reserve Base, as well as unincorporated areas around military base. So it's mm -hmm. a very large area. It's a significant area that contributes to sort of the national economy. Mm -hmm. So nearly 25% of the nation's infrastructure in moving goods is right here in our backyard. And that's significant because if you think about it, if something ever happened on the 215, 60, on the major corridors around us, that would impact the national economy on a significant scale because we are in Southern Cal in California as a whole, the Inland Empire sort of plays that very significant role when it comes to moving goods throughout the nation. So for me, being in economic development, that's my background, and having lobbied for projects in Washington, D.C., I've seen federal dollars sort of, um, you know, get passed in our area because either, either people don't know about it or there's not enough information on whether or not we can qualify for them. So because I have experience in bringing those federal dollars locally, I know what we can qualify for as far as transportation infrastructure goes, flood control infrastructure. We have a federal agency right now who's looking for projects, okay. and they're willing to partner up with local jurisdictions and fund up to $20 million of infrastructure projects. But how do cities know about that? Right. How right. would jurisdictions how do, know about how that? How can we get our hands on that money? So it, the, the best way is if you have a leader in Congress who's informed enough to bring resources locally that they know we could qualify for. And so that's the leadership I would bring. And that was really my big interest in running for Congress because I saw these missed opportunities for our region. You know, we have less than 50% of our high school grads going to college. Hmm. A lot of needs and opportunities for skills training that we haven't really talked about. We kind of missed out on the federal level. So I'm really running to be a champion and a true voice for our region on the federal level so we can get the attention that we deserve and the attention we need. Okay. Um, we've already got your story background, but uh, what makes you think you'll be an effective in de delivering your ideas in a hyper-partisan Congress, because you know everything's 50-50 right now. Congress is sitting on their butts. Um, we have people that get elected as a public official, and yet they come back millionaires, and you know they're making yeah. money and stuff like that. Yeah. So, I mean, how are you going to go to Congress, and what what's going to be any different than what Mark Takano goes? He goes there and he says, "Oh, this is what I'm doing." Yeah. But we look at what's going on around here, because there's a there's a Democratic agenda. And then there's a local agenda. You're supposed to represent the 41st district. That's right. And it seems to me you'll see him on MSNBC. And I'm not trying to bash Mark Takana for those like that. What I'm just trying to say is I'm trying to put it out there is Miss Nancy says one thing and he goes along. Why are you even involved in that, Mark Takana? We need jobs here. We need, yeah. we need things going on. So what's going to be any different when you get up there with the hyper-partisan? I mean, what are you going to – what's going to be different? So I think uh, the – the most important thing to know is that I'm not a politician. It's my first time running for office, okay. as you noted, right? So, yeah. so I'm sorry, I'm playing with the microphone. I'm not. So I'm, I'm a, and and I am a practitioner, meaning that I'm about creating results. I do not promise anything I know I can't deliver. This is key for me. And as a project manager, somebody that has managed projects for years. I'm used to being on time with schedules and on budget. So, you know, understanding how money moves on the federal level and committing to those. So uh, the one key thing that you noted is that, you know, our, our current leadership, our current congressperson seems to represent the party more, the than, party more than it. Yeah. The, the people, the local constituents. Well, I've, I've been integrated in the work in Riverside County, specifically in our district, mm -hmm. for nearly 20 years. This is where my experience has been. And community and economic development. So and and so I'm used to answering to the people. And the other big thing is Donovan is what I found in being successful in these projects I've worked on is partnering with local officials, 
partnering with local nonprofits, partnering with local school districts. So um, in the area of workforce development and education, for me to be effective in Washington, D.C., I have to make sure that the constituents here are feeding the ideas to me. So for me to be able to bring the dollars that we need locally, I have to effectively make sure that it's meeting what the needs are here and that um, that my, my actions in Washington, D.C. are going to be aligning with the programs and projects that are important to the voters in our district, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, the business development in the 41st district, what is your vision for that? What is your... So, um, where what, housing is yeah, big. Yeah, well, what do you think? Okay, I'm yeah, going to cut so you off real quick, but I'm um, like, the decision of where housing has been made. Yeah. It's 30 yeah. years in the making. We are here now. Now, all these jobs that these politicians have promised and these cities have promised their people, Amazon is here, you've got Prologis, you've got all of these major warehousing manufacturing guys, right? They're here. However, the 20,000 jobs never materialized. you got all these developers coming here promising all this stuff. And now, as we even speak, Amazon is bringing in the robots. So knowing that technology is coming, what is your your thing to get people to, because there's a mass exit out of LA. You got a lot of LA people that have been gentrified out of LA and they're mm -hmm. coming out here. And unfortunately, the Inland Empire never had jobs for the people that are migrating this way. Yeah, you're right. So, right, because our, our, the jobs aren't meeting the influx of the population. So uh, you're accurate on that. Um, so there was a contract, the, the Department of Defense uh, released a contract, and I tell this story to folks about uh, 45 years ago that I went after for our region. Because I saw, you know, we see the warehousing, we're like, can we do better? I mean, can we do something other than warehousing here? Um, aerospace and defense contractors use warehouses for their work. Mm -hmm. And so there was this contract that was released by the DOD for the Navy to build their first drone called the MQ-25, yes. the Stingray. Mm -hmm. You remember, yes, just four to five years ago, there were only four primes that, there were four primes that were allowed to bid on. Bid on. Mm -hmm. And all four of those primes had presence at March Reserve Base. I went after that contract okay. and, you know, looked at the criteria on the contract. It needed access to a runway, needed warehouses for fabrication, it needed An space for, and <laughs> growth. So, right, accident potential yeah, zones. Yeah, right. So right. I thought, okay, everything they need is right here in District 41. So I uh, went after the contract, made a pitch to three of the four crimes, and all of them said, this contract will never come to your county. Why? because we don't have the skills to meet the needs of the contract, is what they said. Okay, wh what do they mean by that, we don't have the skills? Is it our education level, is it our... It's education, it was education and technical skills that, that were missing. Um, so when you think about what's attracting warehousing in this area, it's a number of factors. It's, That's it's the infrastructure, mm -hmm. it's available land, cheaper land. And our land, education level. And our skill set, <laughs> okay, okay. right? So, I'm sorry if, to laugh, but no, yeah, but it's it makes true. Sense. It makes sense, yeah. Our workforce skills mm. is really what attracts certain types of businesses right. into our area. So, if we want to be competitive with Orange County, LA County, on high tech companies, we need to have the skill sets here mm. to, to prove to them that we can support their operations and service needs when they come here, yeah. right? So, that is why education and workforce is literally the basis of my platform. That is number one. Um, you know, I mean, there are other things I can go into, but yeah. but that's you know that, that's my thought. Am I against warehousing? Warehousing provides thousands of jobs for my city. Heaven forbid if anything happened to all the warehouses, I would have thousands of unemployed folks in our city. Yeah. So um, so it's not about fighting what's already here, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, automation you met, uh, mentioned robots. Mm -hmm. What happens when everything automates, right? That's right. a big you gotta, question. You got to ch change your skill set. So how about we change the skill sets and get our skills ready for automation versus catching up to the change? Let us control the narrative of the change. Let us get ahead of it. Let us be the ones, when these buildings do automate, because they will, mm -hmm. Let us be the ones to go in, build these machines, operate and maintain them. And those are higher level, higher paying skills. Absolutely. That absolutely. Um, about. It's funny, it's funny that, that you bring that up because six years ago when I was in the fight and doing all, you know, and telling people, ringing the alarm, I said, look at Detroit. In the 70s when they brought the robots and they said, oh, we're just going to bring a few in. They don't, they don't make cars in Detroit anymore. The robots took over. They don't need any human 
a thing. And then we had a, a chance to get the Tesla situation in the Inland Empire yeah. in Reno Valley. Yeah. And uh, Dee, do you remember what, what Tesla said? It, that you don't have the skill set. Yeah, we don't have the skill set right. in our population in the whole Inland, Inland Empire. Yeah. You know, but yet the city of Moreno Valley spent, I think, $200,000 in trying to attract Tesla to come here all for nothing. So it's just kind of, yeah. you know, one of those things. But education, so what kind of education level do we need? We need, <clears throat> yeah, ROP used to be in our high schools, right? Yeah, well, I, I'm a little older than you guys, so uh, I, yeah. mean, I remember ROP. <laughs> yeah, yeah yes. and you know, and uh, and that was sort of integrated into our high schools, and then those are taken out. Mm -hmm. They're making a comeback through what's called career technical education. Okay. Um, we need to build that up. So if we have less than 50% of our kids going to college, and a smaller percentage will actually graduate with a college degree, why not push for certification of skills out of high school? So come out with a with a high school diploma and a certificate in welding, mm -hmm. in nursing, coding, and no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, CNC right. machining, whatever mm -hmm. it is. But those will line them up with a major need with our man. We have about 300 manufacturers along the 215 corridor, sure. and they all need these technical and trade skills. And so why not feed our 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 graduates there? But then here's another cool thing that we can focus on, which I'm excited to actually work on as Congresswoman is promoting entrepreneurship in our high schools. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of needs for services. We have the silver tsunami coming. You heard about that? Yes, I have. Right? Yeah. Five, in the next five, ten years, we're going to lose a lot of baby boomers in the workforce. Mm -hmm. A lot of needs in social services. Let's inspire our kids to own their own businesses coming out of high school and provide opportunities for funding those for them. So whether it be grants, programs for entrepreneurship, uh, you know, endowments, scholarship opportunities. So those are kind of changes. We need to change our education system on the federal level to focus on a more uh, progressive or forward-thinking uh, way of preparing our kids for strong career opportunities. Right. Now, you just said something on the federal level. Um, in 1954, it's kind of in, there is no federal schooling other than the academies and the junior colleges for the Air Force and things like that. So whenever they say federal level, uh, the Supreme Court ruled that lower states and their jurisdictions have, you know, the rule on that. Now, are, are you talking about a federal mandate for the states to have a universal type um, standard when it comes to schools? Is that what you're talking about? So um, that that's interesting because mm -hmm. I think in the state of California, schools have their, are, you know, their sort of independent. Yeah, the discretion of what right. they do. So, because, right, so because they if, you have, if you live in Beverly Hills, your, your schooling is totally different than living in Paris. Yeah, yeah. so I'm, um, you know, the, so you, federal grants, I'm talking more about the uh, federal grants associated with higher learning um, and, and those opportunities. I think we need to, uh, there's such a big push in, in driving our kids to go to college. Which I think is totally ridiculous. And, you know, we need to sort of re- we don't even need to reassess. Let's just do it. You know, we, mm. we just need to uh, sort of refocus our funding our priorities and put it towards uh, scholarship opportunities for technical vocational schools. Sure. So um, for certification, that's what I'm, I'm talking about. So it's, it's gearing those federal programs to support a stronger technical and trade program for our high schools. Right, and I don't want to scare schools anybody schools out there. You talked about the uh, the baby boomers retiring in record numbers, and, and they're doing that. Who do you think maintains a lot of the airplanes that are flying around right now? These are guys that have been in the industry for like 30, 40 years, and these guys are like, I'm done. And unfortunately, there's not enough. There's going to be a mechanic shortage. Gap. So as you go between Washington and here... <laughs> I don't want to scare you. I mean, it's happening now with the yeah. Air Force. The Air Force yeah. will tell you that yeah, they are in shorts, dire yeah. need of not just pilots, but aircraft mechanics. mechanics. Mm -hmm. So um, so I, I mentioned about partnerships with nonprofits. This is why uh, being a congressperson that's integrated into what's happening on the, the ground level right. is so critical because the nonprofits that we have here, there's a nonprofit in, uh, on Flaybob Airport that yes. does aircraft mechanics. Yes, yeah, there's a charter school. A1 Skyraider. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they partner up with, uh, there's a certification, a Spartan. Right, Spartan. Mm -hmm. At Flaybob Airport. Mm -hmm. um, so they provide pre-apprenticeship, apprenticeship programs in their shop, and then the, uh, they, the students have an opportunity to, to then go to Spartan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and Spartan is not cheap. 
It is. And the business associated with that, that program at Flay Bob Airport pays, is actually paying for the tuition. So, so rather than putting that burden on the nonprofits student. and a student, mm -hmm. we need to, again, refocus our energies on federal resources to support technical and trade skills. Um, and that, in fact, will bring in sort of the tech companies that we're right. wanting to bring into the area. That's really well, how we do yeah, it. Yeah, and you would think with all these airports, like you just named Flabob, there's Riverside Municipal right there. You've got March right here. You've got Redlands. You've got, even though that's not, that wouldn't be your jurisdiction, but you've got all these airports. And a lot of the people that run these airports or have airplanes over there are baby boomers. So we got to do something. We got to do something. But, but in the region, one of the biggest problems in the region, and I... I've heard Mark Takano address it. I've heard Aja Smith address it. Homelessness in yeah. the Southern California, but especially in our region. What? What? So before y'all move on yes. to that, you have some questions. Okay, let's, yes. let's hit the questions real quick. I'm gonna hold that. So, up. um, Shante Wilder, she's also in um your district, the 40, uh, 41st district. She says, "Hey, glad you two are doing this. I'm glad to see and hear the person outside of the Facebook post." So she's talking about you. She also <laughs> says, um. What is her uh, plan to improve the infrastructure of the district? Okay. So I don't know if you guys really touched on that, but these are some. We have not touched on that. Yeah, we haven't touched on that yet, but, uh, you know. So, so the, um, okay, so there's a project that I did in Marina Valley. It's a Katahika channel. It's like the yes. two-mile-long channel that used to be a dirt channel right between the base and Full of trees. Not 400 no homes <laughs> yeah. in yeah. Marina Valley yes. along Hecox Street, just south of mm -hmm. Cactus. And it... I don't know if you remember, but when it rained, that channel, the water would breach out of that channel and it will flood. literally flood that neighborhood. And back in 2010, it flooded so bad, one of the residents ended up south of Iris and the, and the, um, the first responders couldn't get to them. Mm -hmm. So they needed to do a swift water rescue. <laughs> right. So 2010 was a year I went down there and everything was flooded. And I remember a jumping right on it. Um, uh, I, I facilitated a partnership between the base, Marina Valley, Riverside County Flood Control, and we partnered up, designed the project, got the funding. Uh, that was like a little over $20 million effort. And that, that uh, project was done just last year. And so right. when it rained uh, in 2019, that all the severe rains, none of the homes, the streets were protected, right. the base was protected. So my plan in bringing in infrastructure do dollars is to exercise that model throughout the whole district because once again it's about partnering with our local jurisdictions identifying what the key problem areas are working together to design a solution and then working together to bring together uh, the funding for it because there was federal funding involved in that project and that was one of the projects that uh, I lobbied for uh, in Washington DC and also I think in Atlanta Georgia with the Air Force so um, that's that's what I would bring is the leadership to do more of that throughout the district. Right. So you got some, so you got some pull. Yes. yes. All right. So um, you guys, well, she has a few questions yeah, actually. I know you're getting yeah. ready to hit so, on no, homelessness, which is yeah. her next uh, question says, "What about the increasing homelessness um, issue? What are her plans to help those who can't afford to live and also help the working poor?" Working poor, that would be us. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the when I was with the city of Paris, I oversaw the housing authority and the homeless program there. And uh, from firsthand experience, again working on the ground level with nonprofits, uh, the things that we learned is that um, nearly half of our homeless population are actually residents that lived here. They had homes, and they were either priced out of their homes or for whatever uh, whatever circumstances they were going through, lost their home. And so that, I mean, that's, that's major. Uh, and, and the other, uh, about 30% were, had the mental health and behavioral health challenges. And, and then we had the, uh, we had um, folks that were running from domestic violence that ended up in streets with their sure, kids. Sure. And also um, foster, foster kids. So homelessness is a very complex issue and there is no one size fits all when we talk about solutions. Right. So, and this is a critical thing that a lot of nonprofit service providers on the ground level will tell you. And so what we need is we need to mimic what Houston did. So in Houston, Texas, when you Google what they did, they, they reduced their homeless population to half. Yeah. And over a period, I think it was like eight years. Mm -hmm. 
But the way they did that was they brought together uh, nearly 100 organizations on the local, the state, and the federal level. They came up with a strategic plan to address homelessness, and they all agreed to fund different parts of services. Mm -hmm. So um, the housing, the housing um, Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, on the federal level has a program that's called Housing First. And that program was really inspired from what Houston did. And Housing First say that to address homelessness, you must house them first. Mm -hmm. So it's putting them in uh, either uh, emergency housing, transitional housing. Ideally, we want them in permanent housing because that's really the, the way to solve homelessness. And then once you house them, you bring in what's called wraparound services. And you address the social needs. Because once you house them, you got to make sure that they stay in the home. And there was uh, one client in Paris, I, I remember he got an apartment with his own key, but still went back and slept on the bench oh, wow. where we met him on. Right. And there was another incident, a uh, case I heard about recently, where they had a client apartment. Well, when the caseworker went to visit them, he had set up a tent in his apartment. Oh, wow. So there are challenges that our yeah. homeless um, population deal with that need uh, a very specialized attention that, once again, our nonprofits can help us with. But it is about partnership, collaboration. It is unfair for our individual cities to deal with homelessness on their on own. own right? It's absolutely wrong. And people should be up in arms at the state level, and sh we should be up in arms on the federal level. Absolutely. And so that's why... Um, as Congresswoman, I'm going to be the one that's going to lead a regional effort in addressing homelessness and do exactly what Houston did. And, I, you know, and that's the way to do it because um, the HUD has funding available for different resources to support develop, developing affordable housing. And we got to take advantage of that, but it's going to take everybody coming together and working together. Oh, she's, does she have another question? Yep. And she... Um, also uh, said, you said a real thing, we do lack the skills to attract businesses, so she agreed with you on that. And she also asked, um, what are her thoughts on March Air Force Base and the surrounding empty land and buildings? Uh, that land would not be empty for, for long. Um, mm. it, it, I know it's been sitting uh, for a long time, but there's already approved plans for all vacant properties at the, around March Air Reserve Base. In fact, if you know where the uh, March Air Reserve Base, where the March Museum sits, right off yeah, of the 215 in Van Buren, mm -hmm. just south of there, uh, March JPA approved uh, industrial buildings on that parcel and that has uh, runway access for future aviation uses. Mm -hmm. So those lands are already entitled or approved for a project. It's no. just a matter of pulling the right permits for them, and that takes time. Awesome. Okay. Awesome. Um, let us talk about, let's pivot a little bit and talk about veteran services. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of veteran services, now you've been on March before now, I got to say this, that new uh, homeless veterans uh, yes, that campus that they made. Yes, yeah. yes, oh yes, my, that, have you seen that? Yes, it was my project. Oh, is that your project? Yeah. <laughs> I, I have some buddies over there and they're complaining because you guys didn't put a pool in. Oh, <laughs> you guys forgot the pool. It's it called a idea. basin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, just go to the basin and go no swim pool, over there. No pool, no, no pool, pool there, but no. I mean, no. Uh, that that facility has uh, if their if their kids come to visit them, there's a little park for the kids, yeah. the grandkids and stuff. Yeah. No. It does their pharmacy. They, I mean, everything they need is it's right, right there. there. Yep. And uh, I think that's an awesome thing. A lot of cities are starting to do that, doing these little mm -hmm. things for uh, for the vets. But I think one of the the main problems that uh, us veterans think is getting the information out to them. How do, how do we go oh about gosh, that? Yeah. Yeah. There needs, um, so the VA, and this is another thing that needs to be improved on the Veterans Affairs side. It, it is about dissemination of information. information. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things, that, there are a lot of services and opportunities offered by the VA that if local jurisdictions knew about, we would do a better job informing, informing our residents. residents right. That's really where the gap is. It's yeah. the gap in the partnership between the VA yeah. and local jurisdictions. Yeah, so, um, yeah. So, yeah, know. you know, because it's like we were talking about the VA card and stuff like that. A lot of veterans didn't know. Now you have access That's right. to the base. And a lot of people don't know that. And they're like, well, when did that come up? Well, yeah. if you're, you know, and, uh, you know, these guys are busy doing what they're doing. So yeah. some of these guys. But uh, uh, I have a question for sure. you. Sure, sure. Are you a member of any of the veteran organizations? 
I am a, a law, lifelong member of the Loadmaster Association, okay. the Air Force Sergeants Association, Air Force okay. Officers Association, but it's, my favorite one is the Tuskegee Airmen Association. Oh, so, yeah, so. Okay, so I'm a part of the American Legion. American Legion. Yeah, yeah so and, and I'm always surprised when I meet veterans and I ask them, which organization are you part of? Right. A lot of them are not a part no, yeah, of, anything. of an organization. Right. And, and those organizations have a lot of information they can share with our veterans. Mm -hmm. And so how can we improve that? I think, again, it's just the improving visibility. Right. services on the local level. Absolutely, um, especially here in this area. Now you have Jerry Pettis Hospital and whoever the congressman over there, if you get in the office, they need to do something to, it takes 40 minutes just to get from here over to the Redlands, you know, yeah. to, to get services. And they're doing a great job. They, they just opened up the ACC, which is the outlet part there. And if in Moreno Valley, Paris, there is no VA yeah. center. And you got a lot of vets that have just retired. I know, there's so. been talks for, for years actually about something. having presence at March. Right. And specifically uh, at the corner where the old hospital used to be. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of talks over the years. I'd have to follow up sure. with uh, JPA on that. But. Sure, sure, absolutely. But um, yeah, um, just off the top, off the top of your head, off the top of your head. If you win election, I just want to know this, and this is not a gotcha or anything like that. What is the first priority that you're going to do when you get in office? For you, just, I mean, just off the top of your head. On policy, you mean? Anything. You just won. It's been announced. Yeah. And that kind of goes with Tay's question. What are her top five concerns regarding the district? So. Right. Oh yes. Okay. Which one do I answer first? Because that's a different question. First. All right. So five. Uh, okay. So five areas of opportunities for our district. I would call it um, education and workforce, which to me are one in sort of two sides of the mm -hmm. same coin. Um, Business development, I'm all about our small businesses and supporting our small businesses and making sure that being, they're being successful. Uh, nonprofits, infrastructure for nonprofits, because we have incredible nonprofits that are doing incredible work above and beyond their resources. They just need help. So I'm big on the nonprofits and building up that partnership. Uh, being integrated with our local cities, working very closely with the mayors and the city councils on their priorities and making sure that I'm bringing as many federal resources to the table as possible so our cities can be successful. Uh, the last thing I would say is, uh, you know, the Olympics are coming to yes. District 41. We are the only district outside of, outside of LA County that will be hosting two water sporting events in 2028 at our Lake Paris. Really? We, I did not know this. We are the I only... Okay, let me repeat that. <laughs> it's 2020. The Olympics, uh, LA is hosting the Summer Olympics in 2028. We are the only area outside of LA County that will be hosting water sporting events. We're the mm -hmm. only area outside of LA County that the world will be visiting to watch these sporting This is This is huge, which means that we not only have to prepare our infrastructure to move folks around, we got to make sure all the amenities are up. We got to look good for the world. Yes. We got to address our homelessness. I mean, so there's a lot of things that we got to do together. And, and this takes regional, again, leadership and collaboration. We got to market what we have, all the assets and resources we have. And we, so, so that's going to be a big priority for me, being a congresswoman, is getting our district ready for the Olympics in 2028. I like that because I didn't know anything about that. So now yeah. you guys here, there's some, uh, if you got a business, you better open it up and get ready. Gonna we got to make sure they're influx. successful. We right. got to support our businesses. Yeah. Right. There's going to be an influx. Um, real quick, off the top here, there's been a big topic in Congress, and um, it's kind of fell, fell on the wayside and things like that. But here's the question. There's the topic specifically addressing African American and its reparations. What is your stance on the reparations? I'm for it. Uh, HR, is it HR 40D or HR 40? HR 40, which is a study, but for reparations in general, what is your stance? On? I am for it. I'm for it. For I think it's it's long overdue, mm -hmm. and you know because when when and it's it's for a study. I just want to see the study they did when they you know. Did Sheila Jackson Lee or um, yeah. So what was the guy before that? But what no? So this is for this a study yeah. to do a study. Right, which to me doesn't make sense. But, but what study did we do for the other programs and that, resources that, that, that we gave? Let's get it. And I'm all for it, right? So it was right that our Native American tribes, uh, you know, that they sure. received what they received. That was the right thing to do. Um, 
Asian, the Asian uh, internment. Yeah, so what, what studies did we do, did Congress do at that time? Because I think we can maybe pull that as a template. I don't know if we absolutely, can. Absolutely, absolutely. But, um, but absolutely, I mean. I mean, it's a tough question, but not is, really. For the why is it a affected. tough question? Well, because nobody wants to come up off that money. We're talking about a minimum of $17 trillion. That's just the minimum that we're talking about. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm about, um, I'm all about creative solutions. Mm -hmm. I think there are other ways to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you think about what our African com American communities have gone through you know, since the finding, the, you know, our founding mm -hmm. fathers established, I mean, if you just think about what Contributions our communities, made, yeah. not just the contributions, but everything that has happened in our, the history. Sure. There is just so much evidence that reparations is the right thing to do. And what more, what more do we need? But even today, think about the, the struggles that our, you know, that our kids are going through. Yeah, right, right. In this, our, I mean, I, I, I could go, go on, on about, about it, it, right? But yeah. I just, I think... I think it's it's something we need to jump on, and it's a it's a good question, but but I really think it should be a short conversation. Short conversation. Oh, I like that answer. <laughs> I love that answer. I love that answer. Answers yes. Yes. Uh, real uh, real quick. Now we have a, a a person that's an incumbent. He has a massive war chest given to him by his donors and the Democratic Party. Yeah. Uh, we know to run a campaign takes a lot of money. Are you willing? And it seems like to me you're, you're, you're really doing a really good job of grassroots and starting, you know, from the ground up, you, you know, probably using, you know, a lot of your own funding and stuff like that, which yes. is great. Um, do we need to get money out of politics? Do we need to? I think, Big money. Oh, yeah. Money. Dark money. Dark money. Yes. yes. Oh, yes. yes. I really, um, I haven't decided yet on, on um, who I'm going to back on uh, the Democratic candidates. It's, mm -hmm. I'm still deciding. Straight ticket. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, uh, you know, Yang's proposal, I, I feel, is so fascinating on, uh, you know, giving every American a certain amount of money that they then decide who they're going to contribute to. Right. And I really, you know, that, for me, I thought was really powerful. We're, because we're, then we're, we're members of the Yang gang. Really? <laughs> Are you yeah. part of the Yang yeah. gang? Okay, like so, Yang. yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I really, I think, Putting uh, power back into the hands of the people. I'm um, I'm part of Emily's list. Okay. And okay. so on, they have a uh, Facebook page for women running for office. Mm -hmm. And two date was it two days ago? I posted which one of you are running for the first time against a sitting Democratic incumbent. And I I think this morning I looked it up. I had over a hundred comments. There are a lot of women running nationwide, and a lot of women that are, are moms like me. I'm a single working mom, mm -hmm. and a lot of women that are man managing a work-life balance while running for office because they are very passionate about changing their community and making an impact. And I'm just so shocked at how many reached out and said, yeah, look, I need help, step. right? Mm -hmm. But but Yang's idea I, I like because that puts the power back into um, the people's Making a hands yeah. because campaigns are very expensive. Very expensive. So I mean, on know. a local level, yeah. You, you think yeah. I've said, I mean, That's I don't... a democracy dollars yeah, like initiative dollars, yeah. uh -huh, where every um, American gets a certain amount of democracy dollars to donate to their Whoever own mm -hmm. um, candidate of choice instead of lobbyists and big money mm -hmm. um, having to say so. Yeah, like I said, I, mm -hmm. I look at uh, Mark Takano who keeps saying, I'm a teacher for Congress. What does that mean? But uh, he's, he's being Congress for teachers. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> there you go. But, you know, I'm not trying to bash the guy because I know Mark, but the point is you've been there six years, Mr. Connor. You're a teacher for Congress, and yet you've amassed this massive war chest as a public official. How, how do you do that? And you can't tell me having that kind of money through the Nancy Pelosi, the whole Democratic system, because I know yeah. how it works, doesn't influence the way you vote. It just you can't tell me it doesn't. You know? yeah. So you know, hopefully we can we can get that in there. But I got another question for you. Mm -hmm. Aja Smith, you guys know each other. You guys are. You I know? really don't know Aja. Well, you, you guys have. Uh, I've been on her Facebook page. Facebook page, yeah. right? Okay, so you know her. That's good now. <laughs> you guys are both veterans. <laughs> you know, well, you know, the funny thing is, here you guys, you guys have a lot of similarities. You know, okay, you guys are both veterans. We? Well, there's obviously a lot of. 
difference is she's a Republican, you're a Democrat, okay. but I'm, I'm just saying being women as veterans, there's so many of you guys both serve the country. Uh, well, she's not a mom yet, but you know, she's got a lot of things going on. Um, what you got three people, it's going to be the top two. Got to be the top two. So hypothetically, if two Democrats become the top two, that's going to be kind of rough to for the Democratic. You think so? Well, for the Democratic people to make a, a, a excellent choice. You know, I think that's why having uh, public debates, public forums is critical. It's really important for voters to see candidates side by side mm -hmm. and ask these questions that you're asking and then seeing what the difference in the, the responses mm -hmm. are. Um, because I, I have a very strong um, background as far as delivering projects and I have experience in bringing federal dollars locally. I can't say the same for our but, congressman. I, I don't know what programs or projects he's done locally. I don't mm -hmm. know what federal dollars he's brought locally. Locally, so That doesn't seem to be at the forefront of his messaging. Right. Um, but I, don't, I definitely don't know Aja. Right. And, um, but I think having that public forum where the three of us are in front of everybody mm -hmm. and talk about uh, you know experiences, answer questions, that's going to be critical. Would you be interested in a drag out, knock out debate between yeah. the three of you. I mean, you know, if, if, if I can facilitate something like that. Yes, you can get that. please. Okay. Yes. Right, right. Absolutely. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm going to work on that. that. Well, okay. you got it. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> now, now, here's the thing with, with Mark Takano. You really can't say he's done anything. What's that that you, you say, B? He's say, he plays it safe. He's, yeah, he hasn't made any mistakes, but he hasn't done anything great. He's just right. safe. He's in the middle. I mean, what, what? I mean, okay. He he's our representative right now, as as we know. Yeah. So as you as a constituent, what is your idea of his performance, in your opinion? And let me just say this too, because hmm. I, I was reading earlier how he, you know, kind of bragged about um, winning as a sixty-one percent to Oz's yeah last thirty-five percent, thirty-five percent, and he actually said that was my highest uh, voter was turnout uh, yeah. percentage ever. So. He and his war chest against hers, I th I believe, was two hundred thousand dollars. Like, like two hundred fifty, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. 250, and hers ending so. Um, and I mean, I think, you know, I mean, we could we could look at the past race, uh, but, um, you know, he w when you say he's safe, he's non controversial, doesn't rock the boat, doesn't ruffle any feathers, kind of go with the flow, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, it, and it's interesting to me because, you know, in the past six years since his time, his time in office, mm -hmm. our population has boomed. Yes. Warehousing has boomed. Yes. Human trafficking has boomed. Yes. The rate of poverty has boomed. Mm -hmm. Homelessness has Boom. boomed mm -hmm. Ooh. in his six years in office. So which tells me that our congressman has a probably a closed mouth in Congress. You know what? Yeah, now, I now you that you put it like that, but yeah, I, I, that and made you me know, think. Like, wait a but minute. I'm, you know... We have a lot of people in our, our district that um, are struggling. Mm -hmm. We have thousands of people that are at the verge of homelessness, mm -hmm. that are struggling to keep a roof over their head, food on their table. This is not at the forefront of our congressman's messaging. It is a problem. I agree. We cannot have, if we have thousands of hungry people in our district, we have thousands of kids going hungry to school, we cannot have a closed mouth in Congress. We need to have a squeaky wheel because the squeaky wheel gets the what? Get the oil. Gets the oil. So yes. why would we keep electing a closed mouthed Congress when people are going hungry in our district? Mm, mm, preach. Preach it. Now, preach I don't know it. about you, but I'm hungry. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and I'm ready to eat. Right, right, right. okay. So, uh, you know, so this is about 2020 is a year of the woman. Yes. It's a big that. year mm. for, for our women. It's you know, and, and women candidates are passionate and ready to serve. They are ready to fight. And I have, you know, everything to lose. Right, right. I've stepped out of a very comfortable city job mm -hmm. with very comfortable benefits to run this race because I believe that our district has incredible potential. We literally cannot afford another two years of a closed mouth in Congress. We can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well right said. Here. Yeah, well said. Very, very well said. So, you know, as, as we're going to transition over real quick and just kind of 
uh, get out there. Is there anything you want to say, like your pitch to say, hey, look, vote for me? Because, you know, voting is a transaction. Oh, my gosh. So Listen. you want my vote. What are you going to give yes, me? Yes, absolutely. You know, um, so, you know, voting is powerful. We need people to show up in the ballots. I have friends that said, well, my vote doesn't matter because, oh you know, I can vote, but politicians are going to do what politicians. Listen, your vote matters. There is an article of a woman. I can't remember which state uh, she ran in. She ran against uh, an incumbent and she won by one vote. Okay. Oh, wow. I, I shared that article on mm -hmm. Facebook. Every voice matters. And specifically when you know that you have a fighter in the ring that's ready to go all out for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, I need as many votes as I can. I need to be one of top two, so that's critical. So March 3rd is jungle primary, March which 3rd. means that on March 3rd, the top two vote getters on the ballot move on to the runoff in November. November. It does not matter if Takano or Aja or myself, if we get 60% of the vote in March, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Right. It's the top two vote getters. And I found out last week that I'm at the top of the ticket. So there's wow, three okay. names, okay. but Grace Williams will be top of the ticket. Grace Williams, doctor, economic developer. I need your vote. And I am looking for your support to be one of two running off in November. Uh, I have plans that I want to roll out and talk about and partnerships that I want to bring on board because it's, again, about creating jobs, building up a new economy, and making District 41 a national leader in technical and trade skills, in high-tech companies. We can do it, but we can only do it together, and we can do it with the right leadership, which is the leadership I'm bringing, which will embrace everybody at the table for District 41. Where, where can we find some information on you? And, uh, you know, like mm -hmm. where you're going to be? I know you got a website, things yes. like that, if people want to donate. And, you know, I mean, I, hey, I mean, I'm convinced. I, I, I want to change. So, yeah, let's so, do it. So. Uh, my website is drgraceforcongress.com, drgraceforcongress.com, and I have my social media up. Mm -hmm. uh, Twitter, I'm on Twitter, uh, Facebook, and Instagram. I also have a podcast, and I'm adding to that almost monthly now, yes. and you can hear me talk about the different issues in our region and how I plan to change it as Congresswoman. and. The phone number on the website, 951-416-0033, is my cell phone number. Okay. So if you ring that cell phone number, it does not go to a staff member, it comes to me. To you you wow. send me a text, I respond to you. You send an email to my email address, drgraceforcongress at gmail, I'm the one responding because interacting with the local community is incredibly important to me. And the one uh, commitment I will make is when I get into office, that access to me will not stop because it's very important for me that you keep me accountable. So when I say I'm going to do something and I don't do it, I need you to be at my door. I need you to call me, hound me because I am accountable to you. You are my bosses, not Nancy Pelosi. I will report to you. And so my job is to make sure that my district is, is happy. Oh, absolutely. Awesome. Um, there was one more question. I just, it just slipped my mind just now, but it was an uh, important. Oh, the most important question of, of all. I don't believe in professional politicians, so just in general, maybe you don't know now because it's nothing to worry about right now. But if you do win, when I'm you do win, your four term limits. Your four term. <laughs> I'm four term limits. Your four term. Exactly. You got yes. that out of me. But yes. In the meantime, if you run, how many years could we expect you to represent this great district of ours? So, uh, so I am four term, term limits. limits. So, um, uh, I would say. Uh, six years, six to but ten. no, no more than eight. Yeah. I think six years is a good number. Yeah, that's a good number. If, yeah, if I haven't, if I haven't done anything in two years, you can vote me out. Right. right. You should vote me out. Right. No, no, <laughs> no, no. I make no. a lot of promises and, here. And, and, and don't get me wrong, everybody. If you got a, a representative that's doing a great job, I believe that person should be reelected. But unfortunately, we have so many that yeah. aren't doing a great job, and that's yeah. that's the problem. But I think take, somebody take, needs yeah. to put term limits in there so that we can we have a, a good turnover of ideas and people. Because Absolutely. because you know, working for Congress, and I don't want, I don't want to say this and sound insensitive, but you know, you have children at home and stuff like that. They're going to be spending a lot of time. You know, away from home and away from your kids and stuff. And so I'm not saying that you, you know, that's what you, I did it, it didn't bother me. <laughs> but you, you know what I mean? It's, it's, I mean, for you to put yourself out there, and I want to thank you because I ran for office and I know 
the knives come out yeah. when you know when you're when you put yourself out there because you care about yeah. the community and what's going on. And like I said, when Mark Takano came out, I worked on his campaign. If you didn't know that, oh, I did. When we, when we got him elected, and I, uh, well, I helped on that year that he ran. And I'm not saying I'm well. I am disappointed because it didn't turn out. He turned into exactly what he said he wasn't going to do. And ever since then, I've just been like, eh, eh, eh. So, uh, you know, for those of you guys that, you young ladies or women out there that are thinking about running, it's yeah, rough. It it's is rough. rough. It's I mean, rough. I mean, they're going to find stuff on you. The dirt is going to fly. You know, and I expect it. I expect <laughs> dirt. I expect things to come out. Um, I, You know, I, I didn't, I jumped into this race understanding there was a lot of risk and that it was going to get dirty and I was going to get muddied up. Uh, but, you know, having come uh, from poverty and worked my way through college and building a career, serving the military, the military does kind of rough you up it does. quite a bit. <laughs> it does. I mean, I, life pre has prepared me for this uh, uphill climb, yeah. and I'm ready for it. I'm ready for the dirt because I really strongly feel that our district is worth fighting for. So Amen. let's go. Amen. All right. Hey, you guys, that is Dr. Grace Williams, last name Williams, but she's her moniker is Dr. Grace. Dr. Grace She's actually going to be at the top of the ballot. She's running for the 41st District of Congress here in Southern California. New face, longtime resident, been here for a while. Army veteran. And real quick, mm -hmm. animal lover? I love animals. Okay, good. Yeah. good. That's important. That's oh. important. <laughs> at, least, at least on my platform, it's important. <laughs> but uh, you guys, check her out. Check out her website. And again, March 3rd uh, is going to be the March election 3rd. for the, the top two. So... Mm -hmm. You've got three people in there, and let's uh, check her out, vet her, ask her the questions, the, the hard questions. She doesn't seem to run away from the hard questions. If she came to the hot seat, I got nothing but respect for you because okay. a lot of people do not want to come here because they think it is, it is just terrible, some of the things that I do to people. So... Uh, <laughs> He's harmless. Yeah, yeah. It was, I mean, you know, it wasn't that bad, was it? No, this is yeah, great. It was, it was great. You know, can do things like that. So I'll, I'll give you that five dollars when we get done. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys, hey, you guys, uh, click her website, like, share, pass the word, uh, donations. Go there if you want to volunteer. Are you accepting volunteers? Yeah, as well? volunteers. Volunteers, definitely. yeah, because you need a strong ground game. Eight weeks to March third. March third. Yeah, so exactly. All the help I can get. Exactly. You. So you guys. Uh, Check her out, and again, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you right. so much. It's Dr. Grace. Right. You. See you guys.